Welcome to our very creatively named workshop, The Forest for the Trees, um, making predictions using forest-based classification and regression. Um, thank you for joining us in the last workshop of the day today. Um, we, and actually I think all of our last workshop of the conference. So you're seeing us in an almost, I don't know, elated state. <laughs> Um, we have a really fun time teaching these workshops. Also very happy when they have all been successfully completed. Um, so we're very close. Um, I'm Lauren Bennett and with my colleagues Flora and Alberto, we'll be talking about um, the forest-based classification and regression tool. So um, I am the lead product engineer on our spatial analysis and data science team. Um, Flora is a product engineer on the spatial analysis and data science team in charge of charting and data visualization and also uh, newly in charge of our uh, online spatial analysis tools. And Alberto is a solution engineer in our DC office where he works with many of our awesome customers who do things largely in the sciences area. Um, and we are lucky that he is also kind of an honorary member of our team, uh, helping us do all sorts of things in building these tools. So all of us are very involved in the building of, of the tools that we're showing you, um, and we're very excited. Particularly, this is a, a, a tool that I think we're all um, really excited to, to share with you. Last year was the first year we talked about it. Um, it was new as of two Two, 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 three. Time is flying by. I'm sure as you realize, we are releasing software at a very rapid pace. Um, but we also, even though it released um, one or two releases ago, we also have been making incremental improvements and enhancements um, and additions. So we'll show you some things that are also kind of new in the latest release that we're excited about too. So. Within random forests and also kind of more broadly within this concept of these machine learning models that we're trying to create, we, we do want to talk a little bit about what is a model. Now, a model is a representative generalization that is used for prediction. So it's about really being able to take a set of data and make some sort of generalization about that data so that we can, so it can be used to make a prediction in places that we don't have data, right? Now we model for all sorts of different reasons. Um, the, the, the main one, particularly in this space of machine learning with things like random forests, it's, it's really about predicting in places where we don't have information about the variable of interest. Um, so for instance, we might have data on um, water quality or air pollution and or on sales and we might want to predict in places where we don't currently have data on those variables but we do have data on many of the other variables that we think are related or will help us predict and that's what we use to create that model of a series of other explanatory variables. Now it's very important when we're doing any kind of modeling particularly for creating prediction models, to understand when we can and cannot trust the models that we create. Now, like we said, what we're trying to do is create a model, what a model does is it generalizes so that we can make predictions. So the, the model that we can trust here, the green checkbox, is a good example of a model that's a generalization right? It's generalized the trend that we're seeing in that data so that we can make a prediction in places where we don't have data. Now what we don't want to see is a model that too closely mimics the data that we're training with. That's what we call a model that's overfit. And actually overfit is not uncommon with machine learning models. Um, it's actually one of the big problems with using machine learning techniques or very data-driven techniques is that they have a tendency to overfit. Meaning that we do a really good job of explaining exactly the data that we gave the model, but anything else is going to do a pretty um, crappy job predicting, which is problematic since our goal is prediction. We don't need to do a really good job predicting the data we already have 
because we already have that data. If it's not doing a good job generalizing, then we're not going to be able to predict in places that we don't already have data, and that's really our goal. Now, random forest is particularly good at dealing with this problem of, of overfit because, well, of the randomness in random forest. One of the, the reason that the tool is called random forest is because there's all these different parts of the process where randomness is thrown in. We randomly don't give, random forest is all about creating these trees. We randomly don't give every tree all of the data. We randomly don't give every tree all of the variables. We randomly, um, make all sorts of decisions throughout that analysis process so that at the end we end up with models that generally aren't overfit, which is one of the real powers of random forest, particularly in comparison to a lot of the other machine learning methods out there. Now there are many, 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 many ways to model and do this kind of prediction. Um, we chose to put forest-based classification and regression in the toolbox, and we are talking about it today because what, we've, what the research has found is that random forest is actually very effective for modeling spatial data. It can be really great at making predictions with spatial data, even though random forest itself is not a spatial method. So even though it's not a spatial method, and generally we think about putting methods into our software that are spatial, because that's, that's where our heart is, um, our main focus is on solving spatial problems. So while it's not a spatial method, it's really good at solving spatial problems, and so it's, we put it in. There are some other methods in the software for doing modeling, including generalized linear regression and geographically weighted regression, which now let you model um, continuous data, count data, and binary data using a series of different models, and we gave a whole other workshop just on those tools. Um, so today we're going to focus in this session on forest-based classification and regression. So Flora is going to take it away and give us the, uh, a, a good idea of how it all works. All that randomness. Thank you. All right, let's learn how this works conceptually. And I say conceptually because we really strongly believe that you don't need to be a machine learning engineer or know how to write a random forest algorithm yourself to know how to appropriately apply this method, to know how to use the tool, to know how to evaluate your model, to know how to interpret the results, and how to use those results to make decisions. So forest-based classification and regression. I'd also like to make a note here that we call the tool forest-based classification and regression, but it is using the random forest algorithm. It just turns out that the name random forest is trademarked, but the algorithm, of course, is not. So it is that same algorithm, we just couldn't call it that, so we're calling it forest-based. So just clear that up. Um, so predicting using machine learning, how does this work? Well, for every model, we need to train our model. So let's take this as an example here. I would like to train a model that can predict dog breed. So in order to train my model, I have to give it a lot of examples so that I can learn how to predict dog breed. In each one of these examples, I'm gonna give it a dog. I'm going to give it some attributes about the dog like the size, the color, the fur type, ear type, tail type, the age, and the weight. And then I'm also going to tell the, the model what breed is assigned to each one of those dogs so that the model can learn the relationship between dog breed and these different explanatory variables. And the way that random forest works is by making decision trees. So a decision tree splits your data based on the explanatory variables into different branches and makes de decisions. So let's say that I gave my model this new dog here and I asked it to predict what kind of dog is this. It's gonna pick the variables that do best at splitting those nodes. So when looking at dog breed, size becomes a really important differentiator. So the decision trees split big dogs and little dogs. This is a little dog, okay, we're gonna go follow this branch. And then it said, well, what color is it? It's black and tan, so we're gonna follow that branch. And then lastly, does it have pointy ears or floppy ears? 
the dog has floppy ears. So the de decision tree led the model to choose dachshund. And random forest uses an ensemble of trees, hence the name forest. And every one of the trees in the forest only gets a random subset of the data, of the, the training data, and a random subset of those explanatory variables. That's why it's called a random forest. So every tree, I gave it a, a whole bunch of training uh, explanatory variables, those example dogs. Every tree is only going to get a subset of that, about two thirds. And then each tree is only going to get a subset of those explanatory training variables. So the first tree, it got weight, color, fur, and tail. And it was able to correctly identify that dog as a dachshund. The second tree got color, tail, fur, and age, which is not really a great differentiator in dog breed. And so that second tree, it failed. It chose German Shepherd instead of dachshund. Because these decision trees by themselves are weak predictors. But when we combine a whole bunch of weak predictors, they become a strong predictor. And in the end, the majority vote is going to win and we'll be able to correctly identify this dog as a dachshund. So each tree is only getting that random subset of training variables and that random subset of explanatory variables. Otherwise, it would predict perfectly, but only within the training data set. It would not be able to predict things that it didn't use to learn from. So we introduce that randomness and then combine all of the weak predictors into one strong predictor and classify here with the majority vote wins. So this example of predicting dog breed, that's called classification because we're predicting a categorical variable. So with random forest, you can do classification and you can do regression. With classification, predicting a categorical variable, that can be something like dog breed. It could be something like uh, species di distribution, causes of forest fires, presence or absence or, of something. Uh, it could be a binary, sort of like pass, fail, um, crime type, land classification. Or we could do regression where we're predicting a continuous variable. So something like healthcare spending, crime rate, mortality rate, sales profits, some continuous number along a number line. So in order to train our model, we have to give it explanatory variables. And the tool accepts those as three different types of inputs, attributes, distance features, and rasters. So the attributes, the explanatory training variables, those are the other attributes in the table with your variable to predict. And this is kind of the most common way that we think about this. So if I were predicting dog breed and I had a table with dog breed and then all those other variables like age, size, color, weight, those would be the other explanatory training variables in my table. But we also accept explanatory training distance features. So let's say that you are trying to model something like air quality. And distance to roads is going to be an important predictor of air quality. Instead of calculating distance to roads and then adding that to your table, you could just provide the tool with a road feature class and it will calculate those distances for you. Or you could provide an explanatory training raster. So a similar concept. If you have rasters with information that you want to train your model with, you can provide the tool with the rasters and the tool will extract values from those cells and add those to your table. So you can, you can add those explanatory variables through those three different methods. And once you have all your variables, then you have to choose your prediction type. So you can train only, you can predict to features, or you can predict to rasters. So train only is to assess your model performance. And we always start here, right? Because you never run a model just one time. You have to train your model and iterate and try different sets of variables and different parameters until you have a, a high performing model. And then you can start using it for prediction. 
So when you train only, you're assessing your model performance. How accurate is the model? Which variables were most important for prediction? How stable is my model? And then once you have a, high, a, a, a good model, a model that you're happy with, a model that's going to be a good predictor, then you can predict to features or predict to raster. So predict to features, it's going to create a prediction feature class. So you could, do, you could do that to predict missing values in your study area. So the same place that you had the explanatory training variables, maybe you had some holes in that data and you wanted to use prediction to fill in those gaps. You could also predict values in a different study area. So let's say that you trained your model in California, but then you wanted to try to predict values in Oregon. Or you could predict values in the same study area in a different time period. So let's say that you found that um, population was a really important predictor in crime rate, and you had some uh, population projections for 10 years from now, you could use those projected values to try to predict crime rate 10 years from now. Or you could predict to raster. So when you have all of your explanatory variables as rasters, then you can create a prediction surface. But in order to create the prediction surface, each one of your explanatory training variables has to be a raster. Because in order for it to make a surface with cells, with pixels everywhere, then it needs explanatory pixels everywhere. So if you provide all rasters, you can output a raster surface. And again, you can predict values in a different study area or values in a different time period. So every time we model, we have to evaluate our model performance. See how well our model is actually doing at prediction. And we give you a few different diagnostics to help you assess your model performance. One of those is variable importance. How well does each variable do in splitting those trees? So in this case, we found that weight was a really important differentiator in dog breed. But age didn't really do that great of a job at distinguishing between dog breeds. Another way that we can evaluate our model performance is by looking at out-of-bag errors. So like I said before, every tree only gets a random subset of the training data, about two-thirds. So after the model is trained, that one-third that was excluded gets run back through that tree. And then we test to see how well that tree can predict that one-third that was excluded. And then we also have some model validation options. By default, 10% of your training features are held back for validation purposes, which means that the 10% is randomly selected and it's not used at all to train your model. It's only brought out at the end to validate your model. So after your model has been trained, we run that 10% back through the whole forest this time instead of just the individual tree. And we see how well can the forest predict that 10% that was not used to train the model. So if you're, if you're um, predicting a regression, then you get an R squared value. And the R squared value is going to compare how far from the observed values your predicted values are. And when you're performing classification, you're going to get what's called a confusion matrix. And the confusion matrix is going to give you two different measures, sensitivity and accuracy. For sensitivity, it's going to tell you of all of, so in this example, we're predicting if something is a dachshund or not a dachshund. So you can see in the predicted column, it predicted dachshund 10 times, eight and two. Out of the 10 times that it predicted dachshund, eight times were correct. So that means it has a sensitivity of eight over 10 or 80%. For accuracy, it not only cares about the number of times that dachshund was correctly identified as dachshund, 
It also cares about the number of times that not dachshund was correctly identified as not dachshund. So the accuracy here is gonna be 15 out of 20, or 75%. When you're looking at binary variables, then the accuracy is gonna be the same for both. But if you are classifying something with more categories, then each of the different variables is gonna have a different accuracy measure. So here is a really oversimplified six-step modeling process. Um, I showed this list to Lauren on Monday, and it was just steps one through six, and she was like, you forgot the worst, most important step. <laughs> step zero, prepare your data. And that's true, right? It's not just for the modeling workflow, it's for any analysis workflow. You gotta get your data ready. And we try to help you out with that a little bit. But we accept distance features so that you don't have to run the near tool yourself. We accept training uh, raster so that you don't have to extract those values yourself. But at the end of the day, you're gonna have to do some data prep work no matter what type of analysis you're doing. All right, so once you get step zero out of the way, then you train your model. And then step two, you evaluate your model performance. You check things like the out of bag errors. You check things like the R squared or the confusion matrix. And then step three, you try again with different parameters. Step four, you compare your models. Step five, you repeat that over and over and over and over and over and over <laughs> until you find a, a really good predicting model. And then step six, you use that model to predict unknown values. So, I mean, I, I'm kind of kidding about the repeat to infinity, but only kind of kidding because you need to try different things and try different validation methods to really hone in on a model that's not going to only predict well with the data that it was used, that was given to train, but also outside of that data set. So you can try different models with different numbers, di different forests with different numbers of trees, with different explanatory variables, with different um, validation percents held back. And we're gonna go through some of those things in the demo. But comparing those diagnostics to each other is how we choose the best model. So let's cut to a demo. Okay, thank you so much, Flora. We're gonna take a look at how forest-based classification and regression can help us with creating a species distribution model. In this case, we're gonna take a look at Oregon, uh, where we'll travel over to the Ochoco National Forest. And the reason is because I'm, I was spoiled by NatureServe who provided us, I didn't have to do that step zero that Flora mentioned where I had to prepare my data. Uh, the Oregon Biodiversity Information Center in Portland State University provided us data for the presence of a species called Lomachium ochocense. Well, we're gonna call this Loma Ocho for short. But this is a species that is critically imperiled and it was recently discovered in 1994 and described openly in 2010. It's really rare. Um, so this species, we have actually presence areas and presence points that have been field validated by NatureServe. And these presence points are gonna be the basis for our model. But the goal of the model is to predict the location of this species in a much larger uh, extent, a study area ranging about 10,000 square miles. And to build this model, we can start with uh, forest-based classification and regression. So we'll need a few things. We will need an input data set of not just presence, but also absence. Presence in this case is signified by the pink points, absence is the green points. So we will pass those over to our tool as our input training features. And notice that we're gonna start with prediction type as train only because we simply wanna assess the quality of the model to start. Next, we will select the presence field in our data set. Every point here is characterized by a zero or a one. So this is a categorical variable. We will treat it as a variable that is categorical. And next, we will need to explain 
how this variable actually turns out. And we have three options uh, to do that. Explanatory training variable, so these could be fields in your data set. Uh, it could be explanatory training distance feature, so if I had perhaps a polyline of watersheds, I could pass those as an input and the tool would calculate the distance from every point to, every, to, that, to that line. Uh, however, in this case, we're gonna work with explanatory variables that are rasters. So we have a series of general characteristics that uh, pertain to the elevation profile in the study area, the distances to streams, climactic water deficit, the presence of canopies and coniferous trees, and a series of slope characteristics. So in this case, we're working with raster data. And we have it here for, the, uh, for that extent. We have a few, the ones that I basically illustrated. And to use those in our analysis, as Flora mentioned, we don't have to necessarily calculate the value at every single location. We can simply select all of those and drag and drop them into explanatory training rasters. And if you had the, if one of those rasters happened to be categorical, uh, perhaps land cover classification or something similar to that, you could select that that raster was categorical through this checkbox. So now I have uh, a basic model ready to go. And I shouldn't say basic because NatureSurf has actually done a lot of work to get it to this point. Um, you do have some additional outputs. So if you want to create a variable importance table, you can create that here. Uh, you can also create an output classification performance table, otherwise known as a confusion matrix that Flora explained earlier. And then there's also advanced forest options, which I do care about in this case. Uh, one option is to compensate for sparse categories. If you notice, there's a lot, meant, a lot more absence points than presence points. So this parameter helps you to ensure that every decision tree receives the two categories. Um, and you that's, can also, that's oh. one of those parameters that um, was added after the first release. So we had the first release of random forest, and then we added the ability to compensate for sparse categories is one, one of those new parameters. And it's very helpful, especially if you have an unbalanced data set like this. Um, you can also select, for instance, the number of randomly sampled variables. At every tree, a subset of all of these characteristics is going to be selected. If you hover over the parameter, it gives you some information that actually helps. So a common practice is to use the square root of the total number of explanatory variables, or by default, the tool will divide the total amount of variables by three. In this case, it would select about three of those rasters for every tree. So we're gonna leave it alone and let it choose a smart default. Also in validation options, you have some uh, additional parameters that you can select. In this case, I'm gonna increase the amount of training data that is excluded for validation to 30, and we're gonna let the tool execute. While the tool executes, I also wanna point out something that is very helpful, especially if you're brand new to using these tools. I certainly am in many cases. Uh, there's this little icon that everyone should select at some point in their lives for every tool that takes you to your, the documentation for the tool. And there's a high level document, but there's, there's also a deeper document that talks about how forest-based classification and regression works, and also about the diagnostics that really, really helps you come up to speed with these tools. Uh, I know many of us don't read the instruction manuals for household items, but for this, we definitely should. <laughs> uh, so the tool is now ready to go, or has finished executing, rather. Let's go ahead and expand the messages window. <coughs> and take a look at some of the messages. So first of all, you get some model characteristics outlining the number of trees, the tree depth, et cetera. You also get diagnostics related to the model out of bag errors. I'm going to focus for a moment on the variable importance. This can be useful not necessarily as causality, but it does help you refine models if you're trying to determine which factors really helped your model in a certain scenario, this gives you a sense of that. And also, you get some classification diagnostics uh, pertaining to that confusion matrix. So here for the training data, it was pretty much perfect, but for the validation data, it was actually really close to perfect, and not necessarily because I did anything special, but really because of the work that NatureSurf has done. So they didn't just spoil me for step zero, they also spoiled me for step five, where you repeat <laughs> infinite times, they've done that and helped us uh, implement this, this type of work. So this is a really good model, and now we're ready to actually predict. Uh, all we've done is train. 
So if we go back to prediction type, we have the ability to predict to features or predict to raster. We're going to select predict to raster. And then the tool gives you a few more parameters to now consider. You can create an output prediction surface. So let's go ahead and name it out prediction. And then you also have to consider the, for the prediction surface, you need to match your explanatory training rasters to your prediction. And this is really useful if you are predicting to a different location. Perhaps your new study area is in a different area and those rasters are, uh, have different names. You will have to just match the right raster to your training data set. In this case, we can leave it alone. It's actually inferred correctly for every single one. And the tool takes a little bit longer to run for predict to raster. So I'm going to simply show you some of the outputs for the sake of time. And let's go ahead and do it side by side. First, I'd like to focus on that area where we knew we had presence of Loma Ocho. And this is the basis for the model, right? And this could be a little bit of additional information for NatureServe or for someone that works with this type of data to un understand where else in this region that species is likely to be. But more importantly, there's other areas of that study area that came back as likely to have Loma Ocho. Not only is this useful for field visits, but perhaps for, for um, protecting this area or protecting the species further. And that is a brief summary of how forest-based classification uh, and regression works with classification. It makes it really simple to do a really powerful algorithm. Um, if you do this in Python, it certainly takes a lot longer and doesn't kind of give you all the bells and whistles to protect you as well in many ways. So I really enjoy running this tool. For a view of regression, I'm going to now hand it over to Laura. OK. All right, so for I'm ex did, uh, I'm five. You're on me. OK. Sorry. Hold on. I don't know how that happened. Okay. Oh, good. Great. I can't see. <coughs> Is this the one I want? What do I want? I can't see anything. Duplicate. Apply. Oh. <laughs> OK. Sorry, guys. All right. So now let's look at using random forest to model a continuous variable. In this case, we're looking at um, asthma hospitalization rates for um, the youth population, children under 19 years of age. Um, and we have um, this data at the census tract level. So right off the bat, what we can see is this is a great data set, but it's also um, leaves something to be desired. Uh, there is quite a bit of missing data here. So we have lots of data about the rate of asthma, asthma hospitalizations, but we've also got plenty of places where we are missing data, which is pretty common. I'm sure you, many of you have run into this. It's particularly common with health data, but really any kind of data that involves people um, when we have rates that are particularly low. Uh, it's not uncommon for data to be suppressed because without suppressing the data, it can be personally identifiable when there's few enough reports. Um, so for many reasons, we can end up with a data set that looks something like this. So one of our goals here is to predict and to model asthma rates. And we want, to as we want to model asthma rates for a couple of reasons. We could use the, the model to predict into these census tracts. But actually, what I want to do is not predict into the census tracts, but I actually want to predict into block groups. I've got a better data set with the smaller polygons. And I have a lot of the same variables for those polygons as I do for those census tracts. So if I can find a model that's good for the census tracts, I can actually predict down to block groups and get better spatial um, scale of this data. I'll be able to see some more variability in these asthma hospitalization rates if I can find a good model at the tract. And I can essentially downscale that data into block groups. So let's see if we can find a good model. We'll go into the tool. 
We'll start, we're in a train only mode. We're going to choose our census tracts, our variable to predict is our rate of hospitalizations. This is not categorical, so we're not going to choose to treat it as categorical, so we're doing a regression. Well, then we have a bunch of different um, uh, socioeconomic and demographic variables that we're gonna use. And actually, each one of these I got by geo-enriching the data. I used the enrich tool in Pro. What's cool is that I enriched it using these variables. I picked variables that I thought might be related. We're talking about asthma here, so I thought um, cigarette smoking might be related. I got some about income, education levels, unemployment, um, insurance coverage, and I included those all in my model, and I enriched with all of those variables. So I pointed my census tracts. I said enrich it with this list of, I think I picked maybe 15 or 20 variables. What I was then able to do is take that same geoprocessing tool for, to run enrich and point it at my block groups and then just hit run. And it enriched it with the exact same set of variables. So then I had a set of census tracts that had those 15 or 20 variables that I enriched with. And I had the same set of block groups with the exact same variables. They even have the same names, which made this whole process very, very easy to do. So I go through, I'm setting those, um, those variables, but I also, in addition to having a set of socioeconomic and demographic variables, I actually also have a series of explanatory rasters. So if we look at these, not only do I have a bunch of different variables I got from enrichment, I also have a series of rasters. I have an air quality raster, which I know is going to be related to asthma hospitalizations. I've got data on air um, airborne toxic releases. I've got road density. I also have a distance to uh, major and secondary roads. So each of those rasters are additional variables I want to take into account. So a big part of the work that we did when we built Random Forest was to make it really easy for you to use a combination of attributes and rasters all in one go. And since I have polygons that I'm modeling here, when I do that when I provide those rasters, what it's going to do is a smart apportionment of the underlying values of those rasters into my um, polygons. Um, and it's going to use that as essentially another field in my random forest analysis. So I've gone through and I picked all of those variables. I'm going to leave those advanced forest options the same. I am going to create um, an, outport, an output variable importance table. And I'm going to hit run. So again, we talked a little bit about the idea that by default, we keep 10% of the data out in order to validate. This is a big part of making sure our model isn't overfit. It's not uncommon to see a really high R squared for our training data and a lower R squared for our validation data. That's kind of what we would expect to see. The model does a better job predicting the data that was used to teach it than it does on the data that it never seen before. Um, a couple of little other little things that I think are worth noting that we haven't really talked about. One thing that Random Forest is very, 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 very bad at is extrapolation. Um, if we, like if in the dog's example, if Flora threw a dog at it that it wasn't in the training data, it's going to it's going to predict it's one of the dogs in the training data, right? It doesn't know about any dogs it hasn't seen. It can't extrapolate a dog type. It can't just pull a dog type out of the air, right? Similarly with values, the way that it works is it that model only knows what it has seen. That's the whole world within which that model lives. So if you train the model on data that's not representative of the full range of values possible, it will not be able to predict some value outside of the range with, that you use to predict. So you really got to think if uh, random forest is appropriate. If you want to extrapolate, it probably isn't. OK, so the model finished, and we can take a look at the results. So we can, oh, I always do the wrong thing first. There we go. So we made it a little bit bigger. We'll scroll down here. We have our summary variable importance, but we can look at that in the chart. Um, our R squared, you can see that our training data R squared is 94%. It's a great model. But that's the data used to teach the model. Our validation R squared is 86%. Actually still quite a good model. It's a pretty good model of asthma hospitalizations. Um, so I feel pretty good that this model would be one I would move to use to make that prediction. We can also look at our summary of variable importance that we just created. And we can get a sense of that here. 
Now, one of the things that I didn't do when I ran it this time is set a couple of new parameters that are in our validation options. So it held back 10% by default, but we have this additional option here, the number of runs for validation. Now, what this will do, if I say 100 here, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take 10% of my data out and run a random, run random forest. Then it's gonna put that 10% back in, take a new 10% out, run random forest. It's gonna do that 100 times. So not only do we have the randomness that's inherent in random forest and then in taking out that 10%, but we then do that 100 times. So that allows us to do a couple of things, including calculate uncertain, well, uh, one of the things it allows us to do is evaluate our summary of variable importance a little bit differently. So when I do that, if I run it, you can imagine it will take a little bit longer to run because it's going to run it 100 times. Um, so I'm not going to bore you with watching that happen. It's actually not, it doesn't take that long. Um, but it's not times 100. Half of the, more than half of the time that that tool just took to run was extracting values from those rasters because it's doing actually quite a bit of work to get a good value for every one of those polygons for each of those rasters. Um, so if we go through, one of the things that we can do when we do 100 runs for validation, our summary of variable importance table looks really different. So this is actually what our, our variable importance table looks like when we do that. It's not a bar chart anymore, it's a box plot. That's because now, each, on each run of random forest, you're gonna get slightly different values for variable importance because of all that randomness. By running it 100 times, instead of having a single summary of variable importance, which gives us a very false sense of certainty in those, sum, of, in those variable importances. We feel great, look at how big this variable importance is. But what we can tell from looking at the box plot is actually we should not feel quite so certain about those variable importance values. And in the 100 runs, so for instance, we saw that median income showed up as the highest for the variable importance. But actually on a couple of runs, it was lower than uh, the percentage of the population that smokes cigarettes, actually. So the, what the box plot shows us is the range of values that that summary of variable importance had over those 100 runs. So the box plots that are small show a small distribution. Those are, that, what that would tell us is that that variable was, you know, that had that value most of the time. What we do see though that median household income in this case is at the top the majority of the time. So I feel pretty good that that probably is the best predictor of the percentage or the rate of asthma hospitalizations and some of these other ones. But we get a very different sense of those importance values and probably a more realistic sense of them. So it's a really useful function for starting to evaluate your model. We also have, and that's new in the latest release, in. Um, in the latest release of Pro. Then we also have the ability to calculate um, uncertainty in these, um, in our results. And so one of the things we can do is look at the range of values also in our R squared. So one of, the way that we calculate this uncertainty in our R squared is by essentially running it over and over again. And each run, we get a slightly different set of predictions, we get a slightly different R squared, and we can look at a distribution of those R squareds. So we can see while I got an 86% R squared at the, the median here is actually 74%. So that's probably a more representative um, uh, value to represent the accuracy or the effectiveness of this particular model. But 74% is actually still pretty good. Um, so lots of different ways, and that's also new in the latest release. So we, we really focused in this release on in trying to help you get a better sense of uncertainty um, in the predictions that we're provide, that Random Forest provides. Okay, we, so we've done that. The next thing that we wanna do is use it to predict. So in order to do that, Essentially, all that we have to do is change this instead of train only to predict to features. And when I say to predict to features, after all the training work I do, I have to give it a set of prediction features, which in this case would be my block groups. I have to choose where to put those output block groups. And then I would have to match um, attributes. So let's say my block groups had the same attributes but they had different names. Here's where I would say, oh, it, it's called the median income here, but here it's med inc, 
whatever the differences might be. So we let you match up variables to make sure that you're using the right variable because it doesn't know the difference. You need to, it needs to know which variable is which. You do the same thing with rasters. Um, that would be particularly important if you were predicting in like a different area. You'd give it the same four rasters, but in a totally different location. You could do that, but you'd need to put them in, a, in that location. And it'll go through and make that prediction. And so we can take a look at the values that we create when we make that prediction. And so when, if we zoom in here, we can see that by predicting to those block groups, not only are we filling in our missing values, but we're actually getting a better sense of potentially the variability within some of those larger census tracts, right? We can go in here and see that those block groups provide us with a sense of some of the variability that looks like one, one rate for the whole tract, but actually we know there's probably more variability than that. Another new thing that we added is the ability to um, create, uh, calculate uncertainty for each of those predictions. And we create a chart here that is the prediction interval, which gives you a sense of the uncertainty. And so we can see um, where we have particularly high uncertainty, and we can select those features um, if we wanted to, and maybe investigate a little bit further what is it about those features that is, has led to such high uncertainty. Um, and maybe we, we might use that information to say these are the places where we might not trust the results quite as much um, as some of the other places. So lots of, lo I think, I, I really like this example of using random forest because I think it's a very, very useful example. I think most people doing work um, with any sort of um, municipality kind of data, any sort of, um, census type data run into this, this problem where they have missing data or they want to change um, between different types of polygons and being able, if you can find a good model, it's a really effective way um, to do that. So, and, oh, Flora forgot something she wants to tell you. <laughs> this is your last chance. I know, this is it, guys. Um, so, in that step five, repeat to infinity, something that I forgot to mention was that, like Lauren said, the majority of the time that that tool spent was in extracting those raster values. So you can actually create, once, once you train your model, you can create a table, output trained features, actually. You can, train, you can um, make features. So you can then take that output trained features as the input when you iterate on your model so that you don't have to do that calculation of extracting values from rasters or from calculating distances to features every single time. And then also, once you find a model that you're confident in that's a really great predictor, when you go in to predict, then you can remove that validation percentage held back. You don't need to hold back anymore. You can set that to zero because you've already validated your model. You already know it's a good predictor. Then once you're ready to go through and predict, set that to zero so that you can use all of your data in order to, to create those predictions. Two good points. Oh, also, I think that it's worth mentioning why you didn't use distance features. Oh, yeah. So in this example, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, in this example, I created those rasters to represent distances instead of actually just giving it the roads. Now, the reason that I did that is because, let me just get back to looking at this data. Um, so these are my census tracts, and if I provided roads and calculated distances from roads, the way that it works, if, you have, if you're giving it polygons, the only way it can calculate, at least right now, we are, we're thinking about some other things that we might want to do to, to fix this problem, but by the way that it works is to calculate distance from a polygon, it's going to use the centroid of that polygon and calculate the distance. Now, if you give it a series of roads, um, now, if there's no road in the polygon, it'll calculate the distance from the centroid to the road. If the road runs through the polygon, the, the distance is zero. And you can imagine in Connecticut that every census tract has a road that runs through it. So you're just going to get zeros. That'll be the distance everywhere because every, every polygon has a road that runs through it. So when this might be a really good, a, a good time to use the distance features would be if I had a series, if every one of these was a house and I knew every house some sort of information, I could provide that road and then the, 
the distance feature would be the distance between the house and the road. And that would be a really great way to do it. But with polygons, I'm much better off creating um, a, a, a Euclidean distance surface and using that surface. So then essentially what you end up with in the polygon is it's gonna get the average distance to roads within that polygon by because it creates the surface and then it creates this average value of the underlying raster. So um, you've gotta think about how that distance is being calculated. If you had, for polygons, let's say you had just a couple of hospitals that were relevant to what you were modeling, a couple of points, then the distance to the centroid of all your polygons might be okay, it might make sense. It, gets you, it gives you some sense of the distance from, from those polygons to the couple of features you might have. Um, but you just have to give it some thought as to, is the thing I'm measuring distance, dis, distances to meaningful given the type of features that, that those distances are being measured from? Um, and w if you're not sure, creating one of those distance rasters is, is never a bad idea. That's a pretty effective way to do that kind of distance measurement. All right, well, we like to end all of our modeling workshops with this quote, which is essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. All right, guys, so that wraps it up. We have presented all of these workshops. It's over. So if you missed something on this list that you're interested in, or if you would like to learn more about Random Forest right after this workshop, you can go to esriurl.com slash spatial stats. We put up recordings of all of our sessions up there. So you can find all of the sessions that we taught last year. All of the slides that we showed you today, they're already online. So you can go and look at them right now. Also, we have links to the documentation. We have links to papers explaining these methods. So lots of great resources there. And we also would love it if you filled out a course survey. Um, you have to do it through the app now. We used to have paper surveys and we used to get far more responses than we do now that they're digital, but we really value your feedback. We use your feedback to decide which courses we're gonna teach in future workshops. We use your feedback to justify recording the workshops and we choose, um, the, Esri chooses a few workshops to provide the recordings for for free on YouTube and we always lobby for our workshops to go up for free and we usually get them up for free because of your feedback. So it really matters to us and we also use your feedback to improve and to make our workshops better for you. So thank you for spending the last workshop of the conference with us. We hope you enjoy the party. We hope you had a great UC and we'll see you next year. Thank you.